Hello everyone and welcome to another video. So today I'd like to have a quick discussion on dimensionless aerodynamic coefficients. So this is part of our series on uh, both kind of wind tunnel testing as well as flight mechanics and modeling and simulation. So what we're actually trying to do uh, is we would like to understand how an aircraft flying through the air, how does this behave? So the first thing that we're going to need to do, one of the core ideas, is we need to understand how all of the aerodynamic forces and moments, namely the lift, drag, side force for all the forces, and then the pitching moment, rolling moment, and the yawing moment for the moments, how do those change as a function of the different possible uh, independent states or uh, conditions that the vehicle might experience. So that's the overall goal at a very high level. I would just like to be able to characterize and understand how do all of these forces and moments behave. Um, so to, to kind of start a thought experiment on this, why don't we focus on just lift? right now. Let's just focus on one of the forces or you can think about it as one component of the force vector. How does that behave? So you can think, okay, I know the lift of the aircraft that's affected by a lot of different things, right? Um, primarily, you know, one thing just looking at this picture, it probably matters the, the angle of attack, right? So as this aircraft has a different angle with respect to the incoming wind, the amount of lift, right, which is the component of force, which is perpendicular to this wind vector, that obviously changes, right? That's not hard to imagine. Um, in fact, you know, I've got a little experimental setup. Let me, let me turn on a little fan right here. Okay, let me set this fan and have it blowing at me. Well, actually, hold on. Why did this thing, this thing is dead? What? Ah, oh, there we go. Okay, so here we go. So now the fan, it's blowing. Right, and as you change this angle of attack, I can feel the amount of lift changing, right? So you might think about going to a wind tunnel and basically running this experiment, right? And what I mean by running the experiment is you could conceivably think about very easily just experimentally measuring this, right? So you blow some air at the, the, the aircraft, you pitch it down at a, you know, a negative angle of attack, you measure the amount of lift that it's generating. In fact, I've drawn it with this little blue arrow, and then you store that as a value, right? Over here. And then you change the angle of attack of this aircraft, you blow that same wind at it, and you measure the value, right? So the lift is here, and then you get another value dot, 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 you keep going ahead and change, 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 and then at some other, you know, maximum angle of attack that you're interested in, you know, you get another level of lift, right? So you can think, this is actually really easy, right? If all I care about is how does the lift change as a function of angle of attack, you can characterize that almost by like a one-dimensional array, right? A one-dimensional list of numbers or a lookup table, right? Where if I tell you the angle of attack, alpha, you can just look up in this array, what is the lift at that given angle of attack, right? Really simple, no problem. You can go to the wind tunnel, do this, that's one run, you're done, right? However, this is where it gets a little bit interesting, right? Because if you think about this long enough, the uh, angle of attack is not the only thing that affects the lift, right? So there is things like, well, okay, how is the, the lift a function of the velocity of the air, right? If I blow different speed air at this, so let's come back with my little example of the fan, right? We were talking about doing this on a low speed initially, okay? And you do this sweep. Well, what if I change the speed? Let, let me make this go up higher. Let's go, let's go to the medium speed. And then I do this again, and, and you can imagine the lift is different, right? The faster the air is moving, the more lift it's generating, right? So you can do this at a slow, a medium, heck, I can even crank this up. We can go, we can go fast and we can do this again, right? So you might think about doing this. You can now have um, a series of uh, test points, right? Where you not only are varying the angle of attack, but you are also varying the, uh, the incoming wind speed, right? So if you think about this, let's come over here to our picture, right? What I've drawn is now, if I want to characterize how the lift is now a function of two independent variables, namely the angle of attack and the velocity, I have to now, like we said, run a test where I hold the velocity constant at some small value and then do this angle of attack sweep. Then I increase the wind speed to be a little bit faster, do that same sweep. 
then I increase the wind again and do that same alpha sweep, right? So now instead of a one-dimensional array, now we're talking about a two-dimensional matrix or a two-dimensional array, right? Where again, the conditions that we've got is, you know, this one right here where it's low speed, low negative angle of attack, that might correspond to this entry right here. Okay? And then you pitch the angle up a little bit more, that might correspond to the second entry, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? This row is basically one row of what we were talking about earlier. But now you've got a second dimension of independent parameters, right? You've got the variation in velocity, right? So now I've got these other elements, right? Where now I have the medium speed over here. You know, I think everyone gets the picture, right? So now you've got a two-dimensional matrix and, or a two-dimensional lookup table, however you want to think about it, right? It's the same idea. We've characterized it by now basically saying lift is a function of two independent parameters, angle of attack and velocity. Okay, and I think you see where this is going, right? Why don't we get a little bit more complicated? What about, does the size of the aircraft affect this? Uh, I mean, it probably does, right? If I double the size of this aircraft, I probably change the, uh, I change the lift, right? I definitely probably get more lift for holding the same angle of attack and same velo wind velocity, right? If I just change now the size of this, I still change the, the lift, right? So now what we're talking about is I will have now three independent parameters, angle of attack, velocity, and then like some area, right? Maybe this is the wing area or something that S. So now I've, I, I, we've rapidly run out of space where I, it's not practical for me to draw all of these configurations anymore, but you can think about now visualizing it as instead of a two dimensional array, you've got a three dimensional array. So you can almost think of it as a cube, right? Where Here's one set of data, but then in the third dimension, right, we have the variation in the size, right? And you see how this is getting now uh, intractable, right? Because every time you add an independent variable, right, you are increasing the dimensionality of this and you are greatly increasing the number of test conditions that you need to run in order to fully experimentally get all of this data, right? To fill out to, to fill out this one dimensional array is no problem, right? You, you didn't blink a ha uh, an eye at this. To fill out a two dimensional matrix is getting a little bit more daunting. To fill out this three dimensional matrix is not, is not gonna be any fun at all. This is gonna take you a lot of time, money and effort. And we're not even done, right? This is not all of the things that the lift depends on. This thing has like control surface deflections, right? This aircraft has flaps. Well, if I deploy the flaps at different angles, I bet you I change the lift again. So that's a fourth independent parameter, or independent variable in this, this system is flaps. So now I need a matrix or a, sorry, a cube, a 3D array with zero degree flaps. That's this. Then I need another completely different 3D array for 10 degrees flaps and blah, blah, blah. So again, I think everyone sees the pattern at this point. Every time you increase as an independent parameter or an independent variable, the, um, the dimensionality of this problem goes up, right? So that's setting the stage of this idea of dimensional aerodynamic co coefficients because what we wanna be able to do now is we wanna ask ourselves, wait a second, um, can I squash down the dimensions of some of these, or maybe some of these are really not truly independent. And if I look at this in sort of a different axis, will I get um, a simpler problem? So give me a second to erase the board and let's take a look at that. All right, so we saw the thing that is making this complicated is that these aerodynamic forces and moments, they are complicated and they are a function of many, many variables. So not just angle of attack, but probably angle of side slip, your velocity, the density of the fluid, the characteristic area, the control surface deflections, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? And by the time you stack all these up, the dimensionality of this just kind of explodes, right? Ultimately, what we're interested in at the end of the day is I want some kind of function where if I tell you all of these independent parameters, this function or lookup table or however it's implemented will spit out the lift that is generated at that configuration and that condition, right? But as we saw, um, experimentally gathering all that data is a little bit untracked. I, I mean, it's, it's feasible, but it's not practical or tractable, right? Because of that explosion of dimensionality, right? So one of the things that was a key um, observation that was made is that actually, if instead of looking at the pure lift, we look at what's known as a coefficient of lift or a dimensionless aerodynamic coefficient, some of these dimensions can be uh, basically uh, eliminated, okay? So the way that's gonna happen is we're gonna, like I said, look at 
uh, coefficients of lift and drag and side force and pitching and yawing and rolling moment, right? So this is how they're defined, right? So you take the lift, you divide by the dynamic pressure and the wing area, okay? And what this gets you is it gets you a dimensionless coefficient, which actually is sort of independent of both um, the dynamic pressure, which in this case is one half rho v squared. So it, it normalizes out the density of the fluid and the velocity, as well as the area. So what that means is that if you have an experiment with a given density, a given velocity, and a given wing area, that gets you some amount of lift and therefore some coefficient of lift. If you scale up the size of the problem, you change the wing area, you, you make the plane bigger, you actually should get the same coefficient of lift within reason, right? So what this is basically telling us is some of these independent parameters are not um, completely independent. We can normalize them out, okay? So let's take a quick look at this. Also, why are these called dimensionless aerodynamic coefficients? Well, again, if you look at the units of this, right? Let's look at the units of lift. That's in units of like Newtons, right? It's some force unit, right? Divided by, what is this? Dynamic pressure, right? Pressure is uh, a unit of what? It's force per area, newtons per meter squared, right? And then this wing area or the characteristic area, that's in meters squared. So again, when you look at this, you see all of these units cancel out. So this CL is dimensionless. Same thing if we look at the moments. So the moments are basically the similar idea where it's the moment. So in the case of pitching moment, it's moment normalized by dynamic pressure, some characteristic area, and some characteristic length, okay? So again, you do the same experiment using the units and you'll see that they all cancel out and you end up with a dimensionless coefficient, okay? So again, we should just make a quick note, a couple of things to call out here. The coefficients of force right, are just the force normalized by the dynamic pressure and some characteristic area, okay? So the only thing that maybe other call to call out is maybe I'll put this in, in um, orange. The, the side force is typically referred to as CY, which I know is a little bit confusing from yawing moment, but again, just keep that in mind. Nomenclature wise, you'll typically see CL for lift, CD for drag, CY for side force, okay? Now, let's so come over here to the moments. Again, the moments um, for pitch, again, maybe I'll use orange to denote some interesting nomenclature, right? Where M is the pitching moment, so CM is the coefficient of pitching moment, okay? And CN is actually referred to as the coefficient of yawing moment. So again, just be a little bit careful that CN is yawing moment and CY is side force, okay? So the other thing to notice, right? is that you have to normalize this moment by not just a, a pressure, a area, but you also need a length. So sometimes, depending on what text or what convention or who you're talking to or what wind tunnel you went to, the pitching moment, it might be normalized by something like the mean aerodynamic cord or some reference cord length of the, of the aircraft, whereas the rolling moment and the yawing moment might be a reference span Again, it really shouldn't matter. It's just gonna scale the problem, but just keep this in mind that this might have downstream ramifications. In fact, when we start looking at how to manipulate some of these coefficients, these dimensionless aerodynamic coefficients, this discrepancy where some people like to use C uh, mean aerodynamic cord for pitch and then uh, a reference sp uh, span for roll and yaw, that, could, that can have some issues, but we've got a dedicated discussion on that later. I'll just mention that here, okay? so. Now that we know these are the definitions of the coefficients of force, coefficients of moment, this is typically what you're going to obtain out of a wind tunnel. And again, we're going to go talking about that um, in our next series of videos of how do you get these from the wind tunnel. The reason we still need the wind tunnel is that what we're claiming is that by looking at these dimensionless aerodynamic coefficients, we reduce the dimensionality of the problem, but we don't completely eliminate it. These the, uh, one common misconception is people think, oh, there's just one single coefficient of lift for an aircraft. That's not true. The coefficient of lift is still going to be a, a function of several parameters, like most famously, the angle of attack, right? I think everyone has seen these plots where you have a CL versus alpha curve. So this is going to look like something like this, and then you have a stall, okay? 
So sure, this is your CL curve versus alpha, and you can clearly see that the coefficient of lift changes as alpha changes. What is interesting about this is that this could be for a given velocity, a given area, a given density, okay? Maybe let's call this V1, S1, Rho1, okay? And now you could have another V2, S2, Rho2, okay? And if everything else is similar, what you should be getting is a very similar behavior, almost identical, okay? So that's the whole idea with these coefficients is if you look at them, you'll, you, you'll see that there's, we've reduced out or eliminated some of the dependency on some of these variables like the velocity, the density, the size of the problem, but we still have dependence on some of these other terms, like if you change the angle of attack, it's going to change. You change the angle of side slip, the lift coefficient is going to change. This, 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 right? Those will all change. So really what this looks like from an implementation perspective, why this is helpful is that we've reduced the dimensionality so that this problem here, this function is not as complicated. What I mean by that is we could now think about, okay, inside here, you might have a CL function or lookup table. This is what you would obtain from the wind tunnel. This would be a function of some of these variables like angle of attack matters, angle of side slip matters, right? And maybe things like, like these control surface deflections matter, okay? Okay, what this would spit out is the CL at these given parameters, okay? What you can then do is Instead of having to stack up multiple dimensions of this, what you can then do is take the definition of CL here to get lift. So what you see is that all you have to do is take this CL, you have to multiply it by the dynamic pressure, right? So you have something which is like Q, uh, and I guess maybe what you, really what this block diagram is probably gonna look like is you, you need some other block out here which is calculating Q, right? So this is going to take in the velocity. Maybe I'll do this in another color, right? You take in the velocity, you square it, you take in the density, you multiply it together, and you multiply by one half, right? One half rho v squared. Coming out of this is the dynamic pressure Q, okay? So now what you can do is you can now multiply this CL with this Q. So now you put a big multiplier, a big product. And in fact, what you should also be multiplying through is the wing area, right? This characteristic area, S. And now this spits out lift. So do you see what happens is that this portion replaces multiple dimensions like the V, the, the rho, several of these independent parameters go away. They don't need to be a full lookup table. They're an analytical functional description right here, okay? so. That helps our problem, but it doesn't solve the entire problem. You still need to go to a wind tunnel to get this part, right? We have to understand how does the coefficient of lift vary as a function of alpha, beta, control surface deflections, things like that, right? So that's what we're gonna go to a wind tunnel for. And in fact, that's the topic of our next series of videos is how are we gonna get this kind of information out of a wind tunnel or maybe CFD or, or by hook or by crook? You need to get this uh, understanding of how the coefficient of lift changes for your problem as a function of these independent parameters. So, like I said, quick discussion um, on, on dimensionless aerodynamic coefficients. Again, if the one thing you wanna take away from it is these are the definitions of what they are. Why we care about them is because we need to build this block this block is gonna be critical for uh, simulating our aircraft, right? The 95% of the complexity of how your aircraft model is gonna behave is here in this block. This is the complicated part. This is the thing that changes if you have a 787 or um, an F-14 or anything else. The aerodynamics are different, right? Because of the different geometry, all these different control surfaces, whatnot. So this is where the richness of the problem comes from, okay? So um, I think that's probably a good spot to leave it. I hope you enjoyed the video. If so, I also hope you'll consider subscribing. Um, if you scroll down and click on that subscribe button, it really helps me continue making these videos. And remember, the new videos come out every Monday, so I hope we'll be able to catch you at a future discussion and we can all learn something new together. So until then, I think I'm gonna sign off. Talk to you later. Bye.